sensation, very little sensation. So this paper is joint work with Jose and Arthur to play at the Brazilian Central Bank. So I don't think that in this media I need to say that, but this paper does not reflect the, the, the opinions of the Brazilian Central Bank. So the main motivation, of the, so the, the name of the paper is Bank's Fiscal Footprint and Financial Technology Adoption. The main motivation of this paper comes from uh, two different set, sets of facts. The first one is that we see this recent uh, expansion of that financial technology worldwide, especially payment methods. So what we're going to do here is talk about payment methods. At the same time, what we see is the entry of new fintechs to the market, right? While the, the more traditional financial financial providers, what they're doing is that they are decreasing their like uh, their footprints, right? So we, we see a, a large transition from the branch-based uh, model to a more uh, digital model, right? So what, what we are going to do here, we are going to focus on Brazil. Brazil is not different in this movement to the digital model, like from 2016 to 2021, we see a 22% reduction in the number of main branches in Brazil. So this is the main motivation here. What we are going to do here, we are going to study how the presence of these uh, brick and mortar bank branches moderated the fusion of uh, new payment technology, and also how this, the presence of these banks can hinder the penetration of fintechs by increasing the dependence uh, of the local economy on cash. Uh, and to do this, we are going to, to leverage this new payment system in Brazil called PIX and, uh, and all the information which the central bank has on, on these uh, payment methods to shed some light on the adoption uh, determinants and also its impacts on competition. So just, just to begin with, just to, to begin, like what's the link between bank branches and, and payment technology? Uh, a key function besides other functions of, of these branches is storing and distributing currency, right? And also issuing uh, demand deposits, credit and debit cards. What we are going to, to, to do here is, is, is basically look on one specific uh, 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 provision of service here, which is uh, the, the, the bank branches, how they provide cash to the local economies, and they do that by lowering the cost of withdrawing and depositing cash, right? If it's very cheap for you for, to go to a bank branch and get cash, probably are going to use much more cash than if you need to walk, for example, 20 miles to go to a bank branch and withdraw cash. Uh, there is also a link between the bank branches and the payment on, on other payment technologies. If you have if you have a lot of bank branches, it's very easy to get cash. Probably the local economies are, are going to rely a lot on cash, right? So if it's very easy for you to get cash, the the, the guy that that's in a, a small uh, store that is going to to sell his stuff is also going to to use cash as the main method of payment. He doesn't need to have like a POS or anything like that, right? So if we like uh, our main hypothesis here is that. If you have this, a lot of uh, fiscal branches there, it's very easy for you to get cash. So even though you have these new uh, payment technologies, uh, you are not going to use that just because there is like some kind of cost related to adopting these new technologies. Could be that people around you are not using the technology. So if you if you have the technology and you need to pay something, but the vendor is not accepting the, 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 the payment method, you cannot use it, right? Uh, and there are also other types of costs like learning, like some people do not trust in digital technology, uh, they don't have information on how to use the technology. So all, all these, these uh, different costs can hinder the, 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 the diffusion of these uh, payment methods, right? Even though if they are like uh, welfare needs. Right? Uh, so uh, what we also what what we also talk here is about the fintech penetration. So these basically digital institutions they don't have a, a presence uh, a physical presence there, right? So so it's very hard for their clients to get access to the to cash because they don't have a bank branch to go. Basically, what, what's going to happen is that they they would have to go to another provider uh, or, or like another financial institution which has like a physical branch and get uh, and get cash at the cost right 
And also this, for these digital institutions, going to be, it would be very expensive for them to, to set up the infrastructure, right? So the, the link here is that in, 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 in basically in locations in which we have very high cash dependence, it's going to be very hard for uh, digital institutions to expand because people would prefer to use the more traditional banks as the bank is also providing uh, uh, payment methods for them, right? So what we try to do here is to, to, to show uh, that if like uh, how these uh, digital payment methods can also foster competition, not just at the payment, uh, at the payment competition, but also on the credit markets. People start to use the, the digital banks, they also are going to get credit for these, these digital institutions and all of that. So we are going to, to provide some, uh, to shed some light on, on these complementaries between payments and credit markets. So just the, the empirical design that we are going to do here, there is a big issue on the indigeneity of the suspension of bank service, for example, branch or ATM closures. If the bank uh, is the one deciding uh, the branch branch that is going to close is going to be very like indulgent, right? Uh, banks are going to, to, to basically uh, close bank branches in locations in which they think that they, they would not lose so much. So this would be very indulgent. What we do here is that we exploit a occurrence of a particular type of private Brazil, uh, which, which are like bank robberies. These bank robberies, they are like uh, uh, arguably exogenous to local conditions. So basically, these are no local uh, criminal organizations that go to specific localities. They just uh, rob the bank and they, and they, and they just leave the, the, the location afterwards. And what we're going to show here is that these bank robberies also lead to a temporary disruption in the service provided by the branches. They basically use explosives. So as they use explosives, the bank branches are not operable for, for at least a couple of months, right? So just to give you a context of the of the banking uh, the banking sector in Brazil, the banking sector in Brazil is very uh, concentrated. So the five largest banks uh, hold more or more than sixty percent of the total credit. So there are a, a large potential gains from increased competition. Right? At the same time, we see uh, digitalization of these bank branches. We see a contraction of the number of physical branches and an increase in mobile and internet banking, and also an increase in the entry and the entry of new uh, fintechs. At the same time that we have in Brazil, large use of electronic payments, a bunch of like credit cards, uh, debit cards, and wire transfers, cash is still like very relevant to Brazil. So cash is still important. So we need that in order to, 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 to show that our, our, uh, our shock really, really matters. What we are going to focus here mostly is on the new payment technology in Brazil, uh, which, was, uh, which was implemented by the Brazil Central Bank in 2020. It's basically a 24-7 uh, 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 payment system, which is available 24-7. Uh, it's mandatory for all large banks. Uh, it's, it's an interoperable, so you can make transactions to uh, all other banks without any cost. And it's very simple. You just need uh, uh, an email or a text ID, a phone number, or a QR code just to do these transactions. It's very cheap because individuals do not have to pay anything. And the only requirement that, that you have is to have a bank account and to have internet connection. So in Brazil, 95% of people have access to mobile internet, so it's not a big problem. Bank accounts, 80% of the people have a bank account, so it's not also like a, a very uh, large uh, 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 restriction here. So you can have a sense that because there is no really, that, that, that this method is very like, uh, uh, this method is very like efficient and there are no like uh, restrictions to use it. It was a huge success. So 55, uh, almost 55% of the adult population uh, have made at least one transaction using using Pix between uh, November 2020 and December 2021. However, we still have 40% of people that do not use the, the electronic system to make transfers yet. So we are going to explain that this was a huge success, but at the same time, we still have like a long way to, 
to go in order to 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 have uh, uh, this this payment methods as being the 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 main industry, right? Another thing that I need to talk here is about also the context of the bank robberies. So basically, these bank robberies, they 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 basically what happens is that these criminal organizations come from other uh, locations. They they go to the they go to the city. They use explosives to uh, access all the cash stored in the in the vaults and the safe, and they basically flee the the city afterwards. So they they are not there. They are not there anymore after after uh, after the, the event. This happens mostly in small and medium sized cities, and it's just during the night. So when you wake up on the next day, basically there is a big branch destroyed in your in your city, and you don't have access to to cash anymore. Uh, this this bank heist are like very very uh, specific. So these bank heists they, they require skilled personnel, careful planning, and expensive equipment because basically you need to go there and explode the whole bank, uh, whole bank branch to get access to all the cash. So it's not so easy, right? Uh, these groups it's very important to highlight that. These are not local, so they just go there to 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 get the cash and they flee the city afterwards. Uh, the cost of doing one of these events is around eighty thousand. The, the, the estimate cost is around eighty thousand dollars, and at least you need at least ten people to do it. So you can have a sense that these are very big criminal organizations, uh, organized crime, right? So he's not someone that's in the city and say, yeah, let's explode the bank and get some money, right? And we also show that there is no relation to uh, other types of crime locally. So it doesn't seem that 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 there is a spike in the, in the crime. So these criminal organizations are get stronger, and that's what's really driving the effects that we see here. We don't see any relationship to other types of uh, uh, crimes. So this one example uh, this, this is a public bank. It's basically destroyed. Like it would take a couple of months to. To 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 get uh to get the the bank branch repairable again right same thing for a private bank in two different states so this is basically what you would see if you go to a bank a day after uh the the robbery so basically here what we have is uh is the three uh, basic sources of data the first one is the data on on the bank robberies. In which we collected uh, information from state police departments and complement that with, with uh, news. We basically have information from 15 states and which represent more or less 90% of the Brazilian population. And we have information on the day of the event, the, the bank that was affected, the municipality that was affected, and if they use explosives or not. We also complement this data with the bank branch line of data. You can have a sense that this is going to be. Uh, the, the 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 data that we are going to use to see what happens to the cash uh, uh, stored in the in the bank branches uh, during that time, right? And then we we see what happens in terms of PIX, which is the new payment technology. What happens to credit, and what what happens to the other payment methods? All these information is from the Brazilian country. So the first question is like, are these robberies predictable? And if we have like this is just like uh, some correlations, right? But if we we if we have this regression with different characteristics of these locations, and we regress, if they are able to predict something about the the robbery, they don't, right? It doesn't seem that it's very hard to to predict this, and this makes sense, right? If you are a criminal organization, you would not uh, uh, focus on just one specific type of of uh, of city, right? We we have some differences in, in characteristics between cities that were robbed and were not. So we are going to focus on this batch sample in which we have characteristics more or less similar uh, of the localities. This is the geographical distribution of exposed and, 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 and the control group. Uh, we are going to use a difference in difference here, but our results are, are robust to a stack of different. So basically, this is the effect that happens to the cash holdings at the branch. Uh, before the event, nothing going on. After the event, this effect basically cash goes to zero and remains like at least like 95% uh, 
lower than before the, the, the crime. What we do later is that we show that that uh, after the, the, the bank robberies, it's what also happens is that there is an increase in the use of pigs, right? And this increase in, in the use of pigs is just concentrated in, lo in, in localities in which we have a low level, a low number of bank branches. So if you have an alternative bank branch to go to, to withdraw your cash, basically you are just going to go there and, and, and there wouldn't be any effect there. So if you have more than four branches there, the effect is basically zero. We also show that uh, that after the robbery, before peaks, people would use more debit cards. After the 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 the, the implementation of peaks, peaks is the one that really stands out as the main method to use to cope with this shock. And all the other methods start to uh, the the point estimate is is much lower after peaks. Uh, we also show that this affects also that, that there are still over two other loca localities that are not affected by the shock. So people start to make transactions to other localities and also to receive a, a transaction from other localities that, that were not affected by the shock. So this is this really seems that they are really adopting the technology. And then we finally look on what happens to the unaffected institutions at the same uh, county. And what happens is that we see that Affected institutions, a class of these, institu of these institutions that were affected start to use more peaks. Of course, they're going to use more peaks because they don't have cash anymore, right? But also the unaffected institutions, they also start to, like the clients of these other institutions are, all, all, uh, are also going to start to use uh, this payment method. Uh, and if we divide between, uh, between like these digital institutions, so basically payment institutions, and non-branch-based uh, banks, we see that the effect is, is much bigger for fintech companies. So, so uh, 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 basically financial institutions that do not have a, a branch-based model. And basically what we, we show here is that they increase the, 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 the payment, uh, the payment uh, technology. And what we do is, is that what happens should, what we aim to do here should see if this is also like spill over to the credit market, right? We see that the payments, the, the payment methods start to increase in, the, in these digital institutions, but what happens to the, to the credit itself? We see that affected institutions, the effect is negative. So people start to use less these financial institutions, uh, but they start to use more uh, these digital institutions while the other, the other institutions basically we don't see any effects. We, we see this very large effect on financial institutions, uh, digital financial institutions. So basically, it seems that they are really like going to the, they are really going to use the, the payment methods. Now they, they, they trust this institution, they know how to use that. And they also start to use the, 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 the digital institutions to, uh, to also get credit. It's important to highlight the aggregate effects on, on credit are basically zero. So there are no effects on, on, on aggregate credit. It's just basically this relocation from the, the branch-based uh, institutions to the non-branch-based institutions. Finally, what we try to do here is to see uh, if, if PIX was able to mediate the, these effects. So basically what we do is that we, evaluate, we do the same thing that we did here, but we do for the period before PIX and after PIX. And what we can see is that before peaks, uh, affected institutions were kind of losing uh, in terms of, of credit provision, while digital institutions were like uh, were getting more uh, market share. But this effect is three times larger for the period after peaks. So this really highlights that that this could be driven to the to the financial digitalization that happened after peaks, but at least some part of that effect that we see there is because of the peaks implementation. So just to wrap up here, so this paper provides evidence of, uh, that disruption of the bank branches operation uh, really influenced the, the, the use of digital technologies. We showed that a, a new financial technology uh, uh, which is called PIX is the preferred choice uh, of, uh, of people after, uh, after a shop. Uh, and this, and also that this increased technology use is still over to other, uh, to, to other municipalities and other non-affected uh, uh, non institutions, right? 
and we also shed some light on the on the on on uh, this, this this is not uh, I, I'm not showing here because of time, but basically what we also show is that this is also able to to affect the, the not the decision on payments, but also the decision on 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 the credit uh, provision uh, by 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 the clients. Thank you. Sir. Talk about, I guess it's not funny for the people whose names are wrong, but <laughs> it's sort of a romantic uh, story to talk about. Again, disclaimer don't attribute these comments to the governing council or healthcare policy. Obviously. So there's this new payment method, PICS. Uh, it's publicly run by the central bank. Uh, it's mandated participation by FIs. That's a real key component of PICS. I can address you, even if you're another financial institution, and all financial institutions with more than 5,000 clients have to participate. That's a, that's a stick that I think a lot of uh, governments wouldn't be willing to use. Brazil just didn't. Uh, it's not a CBDC, so it's still private money that's going through a public rail. So it's, it's brought up a lot in CBDC discussions, and I think it's Probably both a substitute and a complement to a CBDC. The Bank of Brazil was seriously talking about a CBDC, sort of alongside PICS. Uh, it's very cheap for both the consumer, the consumer pays nothing, and the merchants pay very little relative to merchant fees in Brazil are massive for credit cards, like 5%. Uh, it's now ubiquitous. So I was just down in Brasilia. And we asked every waitress and every cab driver and everyone we met about picks, and they all heard it, which for a central bank is a big deal. We try and discuss what CBDC is with waitresses, and we get discussions about Bitcoin. But <laughs> picks, is, picks is actually well known in, in Brazil and what it used. Uh, new technology adoption, which is sort of what this paper to me is about, to me is really about this new technology. It's not as simple as static one on one graphs. So we need we need some variation that's going to trace out some some uh, outcomes because there's there's lots going on here. So there's beliefs about adoptions. We have to have beliefs about future costs. There's network effects. There's incumbency reaction. So I'm an IO economist. All the fun things that Dynamic IO has tried to study. This paper has got a real fun exogenous local variation quality of the incumbent, which is bank robberies. I'm gonna. Just the pictures too, just the way it contrasts. In Canada, when a bank is robbed, someone goes in with a gun or not with a gun and says, give me some money. And then you give me money, and then maybe he gets arrested. But the key is that the optimal level of cash can get restored overnight. So there should be really no effect on cash usage at a local level because of the bank robbery. In Brazil, as, as my friend showed, they blow up the bank, they get into the vault, they take all the cash. The branch has to be physically rebuilt. And when I first read the paper, I was reading the word explosions, and I thought that's a little aggressive of a word. And then I flipped through and I thought, no, they mean they're blowing up the bank. Okay. And it's a key factor that I think speaks to the, the clean identification, which I believe. I like I, I like how the, the identification is sort of discussed. I'm gonna have some comments about what we're really learning, and maybe how to interpret it. Uh, there's these national gangs. So this is important. There should be no change in the local beliefs about safety, particularly about the safety of cash. I shouldn't believe that because they robbed the bank, they're going to rob me next week. Uh, they also sort of use something that's common in I.O., these sort of isolated markets where there's only one branch or only a few branches, and the cost of getting cash is dramatically increased. I got to go to the next way or the next area. And then the time to rebuild branch. I already discussed. The results are pretty clean. Uh, this cash inventory of raw branches is much lower. That's almost like a first stage. Almost, that's the instrument. Uh, picks adopted more and used more. I think those are pretty good numbers. It's a pretty, a pretty large effect. Uh, other electronic payments increase. I didn't focus as much on your credit. I, I, I'm really focusing on the, uh, the, the, the payment method uh, story. Uh, so when there's a robbery, people use more debit, but then after picks, people are substituting towards picks. And that, I think, really tells us a lot about the substitution patterns between these products. 
which is an IO economist that potentially has a central banker is what you should care about for thinking about design and thinking about the effects of, of a payment system. Uh, main comment, something about a model of adoption. So I think I think we're kind of in a world where there's this, there's this famous model of, of, of cash usage and cash balances, Bob Tobin, and then there's these famous models about your technology adoption. There it's hybrid corn. Just relabel it to uh, you cited some really recent work, but there's a long history of new product adoption. Already there's some insights. So you're talking about cash holding costs a little bit in the paper. I think that's a little confused. I think it's really access costs. And I think maybe in this paper you don't need a full model, but just spelling out a model verbally would help uh, illustrate some of these uh, some of these ideas. I think there's a lot to say from some of these adoption models about because this is a large effect. We're actually going to get a bunch of people who are probably pretty far from adopting the price, and they're going to adopt it. And I think you're worried, you're going to learn a lot about a model of networks and a model of, uh, of adoption. Uh, another main comment. So your most of your uh, most of the the causal estimates are at the level of the market, the sort of app totals, uh, untreated and treated markets. Uh, results really come from two sources. You discuss this a little bit. Direct effects, my cap is harder to get, therefore I'm going to adopt picks, but also indirect effects. Of now the network of picks is larger, I'm going to be more likely to get acceptance, and I'm more likely to have the double coincidence of wants and that. Uh, these are econometrically difficult to untangle. It's not clear you can do it or not to do it in this paper. I think more of the microdata. Because from my understanding, the PICS microdata is extensive. So maybe future work around uh, uh, more of the microdata. Because I think the spillovers don't exactly get all the way there in, in terms of, in terms of uh, yeah. So, so you're telling us about spillovers to other municipalities. That's a little different than indirect and direct effects of, of, of adoption. Of adoption. Uh, to conclude, it's a very important and timely paper. Uh, fast retail payments, Brazil is this world leader. I think all of us can learn a lot in the central banking world from Brazil's example. Uh, we can learn a lot about these substitution patterns. Uh, we could think, I think a lot about this adoption curve. I mean, you can even think about policies that say, hey, cash was more expensive for a little bit. People tried picks and liked it. So I think something very interesting to look at is, I think your sample stops at six months. There's now been some more time could you look at do people still use it a year later? Or are they using picks as a substitute in the short run and then going back to cash? That's that I think is, is very important. Uh, welfare effects. Well, I don't think that they went around and said uh, we're going to introduce picks because we have this problem of, of people <laughs> losing cash, but it actually should have a substantive welfare effect for these this little area. They were economically destitute and didn't have cash for a while. It must have been harder for them to trade. Now picks makes it easier for them to trade. Uh, in, a, in a sort of a different uh, way, there was a problem in Brazil that people were getting uh, kidnapped and they, they put a gun in your head and said, give me your picks. So the Brazilian Central Bank actually put a limit on how much could be transacted after 6 p.m. of $500. I think that's a whole other paper that would be great. Uh, minor comments reverse causality. Uh, do robbers target by cash usage branches or times? So I think your sort of balance thing is all about cross N. There is there should be some cross T variation. You could have even condition the pre trend on current cash level, I think, using the data. Uh, inverse hyperbolic sign, econometrically, people are less happy about that. You could just model the zeros. Uh, just readability means the dependent variables in the tables and then something with the units. Sometimes it's a little unclear what the units are, but other than that. So um, these are the pictures from main trans. This is what happened for SVB, and this is what happened um, you know, in Britain. In 2007, not Northern Rock. And I, you can see here very well, but the story tells us is that 
we have a lot of digitalization, right? And a lot of regulation, but we still have bank funds. And they are pretty much the same as in the 1930s. And the only difference is that here, people are holding onto their cell phones, <laughs> but it doesn't really help them because they still, you know, it takes a couple of days to transfer your money into a bank account, to another bank account, there's additional uh, transaction costs and so on. So people still withdraw cash. Now, what will happen if you introduce it this year? Will it impact the nature of bank funds? And should bank funds be mitigated differently in CBDC? And then finally, how will the behavior of banks change? Will they offer di different deposit contracts to CBDC? So CBDC is still that work, you know, that everyone perceives differently. There are many types of CBDC. What do we actually mean? Uh, here, it's very standard. CBDC is directly liability of the central game. Uh, but the important thing is that it, it coexists with cash. We want to keep it realistic. It is not remunerated and it's demand driven, which means depositors choose how they want to withdraw their funds in CBDC or in cash. And that basically determines um, the, the money uh, in the report. <laughs> And also, the important assumption here is that when depositors withdraw, it's going to be faster to withdraw to PC than cash. We will abstract from how uh, the funds were initially put into the banking. So we don't, we don't specify the distribution model. It's just a question of how it will be withdrawn. And there is actually a lot of uh, literature already uh, on CDC, you know, some people in the audience have uh, have papers on that. Um, bank grants. Uh, we also will rely a lot on the class for bank grant literature. And this is going to be a model uh, of bank grants, which will finally calibrate to Canadian economy. So we will start by first saying that our economy has two types of goods, digital and physical. And depositors may prefer either digital or physical because they don't know what it will be. And they, they will be uh, emerged into this diamond and digital setup where they will only know what type of food they will prefer in the interim period. So that can be changed. Instead of saying that somebody is purchasing a digital food and not physical food, we can say that you know we have some old folks or 18 years old who do not know how to use CBDC, and they will be uh, they will be preferring cash. And we have some young folks, you know, who are good with CBDC, and they um, they will prefer um, to use it. But for our simplicity, let's just assume we have two types of goods. The proportion of uh, digital consumption is going to be data, and physical is one minus data. Now, if somebody withdraws deposit from a bank account in CBDC and then spends it digitally, there is no hurdle cost for that. Now, if you withdraw CBDC and then you purchase a physical good, there is going to be an exchange rate. So there is some, some hurdle cost for doing this. And we will assume that this is a very small cost, which is important for our funding. And the same thing happens when you withdraw in cash, and then if you consume physically, there is no hurdle cost, but if you consume digitally, there is going to be a cost. Now about dynamics. So this is a diamond and digit model uh, with some simplifications. Uh, In the first period, we have a set of depositors. Each depositor puts one unit in the bank. And then the bank serves as this insurance device uh, for those who are patient and impatient. So the bank will invest these deposits into the asset, which will pay one in the middle period and R, return R in the second period. At equals one, posters will learn their types, physical, digital, patient, and patient, and then decide how they want to withdraw. Uh, we will be relying on the models of sequential service constraint. 
So that means that the positives are waking up one by one, and they decide sequentially uh, how they want to withdraw. And when they decide, they know they're already blind. And then finally, uh, in the second period, this will fail and the borders will match. Now, here's an also an important thing here is that in the middle of withdrawals, the bank may actually respond to each withdrawal by imposing some penalties or rewards on the promised depositor. So this is actually very much in line with uh, thoughts. Uh, thoughts model on bank grants. And it's important to say here, why would we consider this particular type of regulation on the bond grants? So this is basically a dynamic type of regulation of bank grants, right? So we, we have some, some, some regulations, which is exempted, like deposit insurance, right? And um, Land of last reserve policy, right? But there is also some regulation which happens after the run has started. Uh, so some people have asked me, uh, why why do we go with penalty? So I added this uh, this table, which basically tells us, well, what what else can we do, right? Uh, so in the past, the bank runs were regulated differently. Uh, deposit freezes and banking holidays were used a lot in the thirties. Theoretically, yes, anything is a point. This is not this is not better than imposing penalties, right? But it was it was very popular in the thirties when it kind of worked okay, but only because the policies were very uh, specifically tailored to the US economy. On the other side, in Argentina, it didn't work at all. There was a complete collapse, um, panics, and uh, eventually, it led to uh, enormous uh, economic meltdown. What else did people do in the past? Well, they tried to increase the rate to stop the main grants. And that is also you know, something that's unlikely to work because how much can you increase the rate if you have a global pain? Right? That though worked in Russia last year. In 2022, there was, you know, the, the war in Ukraine started. In, there was a big bank. Then uh, the central bank increased the, the rate from 9.5% to 20%. This is like a single increase. And it really stopped the run because you know, the 20% then you can keep the deposits. And they, they were able to decrease the, the rate very fast. So now it's 7.5 again, just over again. So it worked. But you know, this is something we cannot consider in the you know US or Canadian products, right? Because how much can we change the rate? So again, this, this is not going to work. Uh, and then other other ways to solve the bank hand problem were proposed. So for example, the banks were promising to take the deposits back if you withdraw funds, then and you will change your mind in two days. Maybe the bank will take your deposits back and this will repay your penalty. So maybe it will attract you backwards. So that was used actually by some bank in 1982, Hartford Federal, but it didn't help much. The bank was eventually merged. So again, that doesn't work. And then we know deposit insurance is also kind of working and not working. Uh, this, this is exactly the example of when everyone was uh, covered by the deposit insurance and it was received. So we need something else, uh, something else in addition to these policies that don't help with bank grants. And usually people say, what about land of last reserve? And maybe there's some resolution. Okay, so let's say we have the land of last reserve as our last policy. But what can we do before that happens? Is there a way for us to slow down the run or maybe prevent it before we reach the point of land of last reserve? So here in this model, we assume that the bank, um, after it will deplete all its liquid assets, it will be going through a resolution in some way. But before that, we, will, we still want to prevent the bank. Okay. So let's go back to the model. Now, when I explain you why, why penalties may be the only way to do it, 
Uh, let's go back to the model and see what 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 is the best strategy for the game. Okay, this is an important thing: is that when depositors withdraw, the bank doesn't know what is who is withdrawing. Is it patient depositor or inflation digital or physical? So the bank can only condition its strategy based on the number of withdrawals, right? And Okay. And that's that's how the story goes. Uh, before I will go into that uh, that model, uh, let me tell you that you know, in Darwin and Digit there are two equilibria, and people don't want to bother with two different equilibria, so they decided to use sunspot. And sunspot is kind of this variable, like a flipping point, that helps you to say which type of equilibrium it is bad equilibrium or good equilibrium. And we will be also using this tool of sunspot, typical for bankers. So we will say that, uh, you know, sometimes things go really well in the world and sometimes they're not. And that is determined by nature. So sunspot is determining uh, how well things are going. And we can say that every depositor wakes up with some needs and has some coordination device where it knows how things go. And based on this sunspot that it observes, which is a number between zero and one, the depositor then decides if it wants to withdraw or not. It will also observe the time of withdrawal. And so basically the strategy will be is that if sunspot is small, then the old depositors will withdraw. And then if sunspot is large, then only impatient depositors will withdraw. So right now I'm going to present a very specific type of equilibrium where a sunspot you know, can be uh, separated by a threshold into large and small. They can be more complicated equilibrium where you know depending on what sunspot is, there can be withdrawals of different magnitude. But let, let's now focus on that. And that idea that when sunspot is small, then all of them will grow, and when it is large, then only fine patient uh, depositors will grow. Now, the bank doesn't know why people are withdrawing. So the bank needs to wait until pi plus epsilon withdrawals to make a conclusion about the state of the world. When it's pi plus epsilon, the bank knows whether this is a bank run or whether this is just uh, good, good equilibrium when there is no bank. Okay. And so when when this is a bank run, we have a very interesting setup is that first five depositors will withdraw, and here we'll have patient and patient depositors. And then the bank will realize, oh, it's actually a bank run. So the bank will impose penalty. Uh, and and that will that will stop the run in the sense that only impatient depositors will continue to withdraw. Okay. Uh, and now, if if there is no bank run, so the bank will see that after the file withdrawals, nobody else is running, so it will not impose the penalty. And then uh, my discussion was I said we don't have enough formulas. So I had some formulas in here. Uh, which is basically how this model is solved. Uh, and this is uh, like a dynamic program model, you know, where you have in that case we had two different uh, statements, right? But uh, what, what you do there is that you basically you optimize the behavior of the bank. And the bank decides on what is going to be the contract offered to the depositors. And the contract will consist of two parts, long-term rate and short-term rate on two different types of deposits. Uh, and this can be actually solved explicitly. So there is an explicit solution for that. Okay. So an important thing, um, an important thing here is that we have two types of goods digital and physical, and basically, now we have a reason for CBDC. Because those who will spend digitally, they will withdraw in cash, right? So there is a transaction cost which you want to minimize by introducing CBDC. 
Now let's add CBDC. When we add CBDC, what happens is a depositor now faces a choice of either withdrawing in CBDC or skipping CBDC line and joining the cash line to try to withdraw in cash, right? So that slows it down because there is a payload. Either you will draw it now in CBDC, or if you don't like CBDC, you have to wait until the CBDC line ends, and then you have to withdraw in, in cash. And next, let's assume that the banker is a very smart, technologically advanced banker. So it can impose the computational triggers and some smart contracts on the CBDC withdrawal. And although CBDC happens very fast, the banker can impose the penalties on CBDC withdrawals. We will relax this assumption later, but for now let's assume that the banker can uh, adjust um, the costs on CBDC in CBDC line. Okay, so then what, what is the impact of CBDC on bankers? So first of all, grants will happen much faster with CBDC and no CBDC. And that's going to be a mixed currency run. But it's going to be tilted towards CBDC. The important thing is that exposed regulation will be required for CBDC, but not for cash withdrawal. So this is happens actually because our transaction cost is very small. Let's look at the welfare impact. So first thing is that CBDC will benefit digital consumers who can now spend digitally without transaction costs. At the other hand, it will harm physical consumers because they have to withdraw digitally and spend physically. But the big thing of the paper is that the banks will observe the run sooner from digital withdrawals only, so they will re react with penalties sooner. Let me show you now. So this is the same picture I showed you, but now we have first CBDC line and then cash line. And in CBDC line, usually, if it was no, no bank run equilibrium, five, time day, five times later, depositors that would withdraw. So basically, the bank would need to observe only five times data withdrawals to understand that this is a run. And this is the information channel that I will be on. Basically, uh, the bank will understand that this is a CBDC bank run faster than it would understand that it is a cash bank run. And that's why it can impose penalties sooner and it can regulate uh, the bank runs better which will improve welfare. And this is just how it happens, is that, um, you know, here you will, there will be some impacts coming from Tau that now there is some transaction costs which will, you know, penalize cash, uh, physical consumers, and it will be in favor of digital consumers. But overall, the impact will be higher due to the information. Okay. Now, is it, is it important to control CBDC? What if we will not catch up with CBDC withdrawals? Right? So there are no something like smart contracts, computational triggers. Then I have to say there's going to be a problem because everyone will withdraw in CBDC and it's going to be a CBDC panic on them. So it is very welfare inefficient. Which, which tells us that it is extremely important to control the CBDC withdrawals for CBDC to be well protected. I'm just going to skip that part and show you um, some experiment I did to the Canadian data. So um, this is the average uh, Canadian bank. You can say during the financial stress. So this is calibrated with stress as data. And this is for the days when we had very low interest rates. I just have like this slide in it. <laughs> and you can see, um, so the dotted lines here, this is without CBDC. 
and this is with CBDC. And you can see that without the bank run, CBDC will increase the deposit rates uh, for, for depositors. But also, if we regulate CBDC withdrawals, uh, then it's going to be smaller penalties uh, on the rates. How much will be the penalty? The penalty will be around $300 for withdrawal of 100000 So this is something that can uh, make the efficient regulation and that can uh, prevent the bank. Let's please try to all. Uh, so again, with CBDC being introduced, bank runs become much faster and take place rather in CBDC than cash, which makes us uh, think about disproportional money creation in stress. And it also makes us uh, think about how to regulate them. So we show that it's very important to respond to CBDC withdrawals in real time. Otherwise, it will become uh, inefficient. And I'm just going to stop here. I'm thinking about it. Uh, so first, a disclaimer is that I did see a, a little bit of an older reading of the paper than Sophia presented today, uh, but I think most of my suggestions uh, is right. Um, so what is the paper about? So today, if we go to let's say the corner store and we buy a uh, Pepsi, then you can pay with cash with public money, or you can use your debit or your credit card with private money. Uh, so that's a physical purchase. But if you go to the digital marketplace, to Amazon, you can only use your credit card or, or you can only use private money. But even though uh, 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 maybe some people would prefer to use public money. So CBDC would actually offer the option also in the digital marketplace to use public money to those who uh, would like to do so. So this paper then uh, uh, studies the effect of, of giving this option uh, in a standard banking model on bank runs and welfare. Uh, so one of the things that we like about it is that it clearly is about the CBC as a new means of payment, as opposed to a historic value function, which is something I've worked on myself. Uh, so what are the, the, the main results that I uh, identified in, this, in, this, in the draft I had is that first, uh, in normal times, this could increase welfare because it allows uh, some consumers who like to use public money in the digital marketplace to actually do so. So, as the PX main. But in stress times, it could decrease welfare. So, there's a trade off. And the reason is that uh, if you're worried about banking stress of CBC, you can withdraw much faster. But then people end up holding CBC, even though they would like to make physical purchases. And this then induces a cost. So, there's an over reliance on the CBC. Uh, and then the third result is that it may allow banks to respond faster to uh, bank run. Uh, that is an interesting paper, very promising uh, modeling approach, and we have to see further to develop as well. Um, it was still a work in progress. I'm going to have some comments, especially about the first two uh, results. So very briefly, uh, it's a diamond and dipping model. Uh, so that always has this uncertain liquidity need of consumers. Uh, and Sophia adds to this an uncertain digital need. And what does this mean? Initially, everyone is identical and has some money deposited with the bank. But then at the interim period, uh, they can be a, the consumers find out what their type is and they can be a four type. So what's common in this literature is that you're inpatient and patient agents. Which means that some people find out that they simply have to consume what they want to consume right now. Right? So they're inpatient. And the other uh, uh, part of uh, the consumers, they are indifferent to consuming now or later. So what is new then is that there's two more types. So whether you're inpatient or patient, you can also find out whether you like to go to the corner store or whether you want to go to Amazon. So whether you want a physical purchase or a digital purchase. After consumers find out their type, there's a withdrawal game. So you just heard all the details, but without getting into those again, what happens? We all line up and one by one, we can make the choice. Do we leave our money in the bank or do we withdraw? Uh, initially, uh, the second thing I really like about the paper is that it uh, uh, first considers a model without CBC, in which case you can withdraw into cash. Uh, so first we think, okay, 
If there was only cash in today's world, how did this work? Then we're going to introduce you. So what happens if you're impatient, right, you're going to withdraw. If you, are, you want to consume now, you're going to take out the cash and, and, and you're going to uh, eat. Um, but if you're patient, then there's a choice. Right? And this choice may depend on, on a certain thing. There's a few things. Your place in line, uh, your type, and uh, the, the contract that the bank offers, the payments you can get. The two more uh, parts of the model. Uh, uh, first, another aspect that I like is that CTR considers two types of deposit contracts, which you didn't really highlight in the presentation today, but a bank can either offer a contract with commitment, which to me is more of a standard dynamic a contract, which means there's six payments uh, at TS1 and TS2. Everyone gets the same if they withdraw uh, in per period. And the second contract is without commitment, which means the bank can, let's say, real time adjust the payment. So what you get when you withdraw depends on uh, uh, how many people have withdrawn before you. Uh, and then there's an exchange cost, which means if you uh, switch between digital and physical means of payment during your cost. I think the wording you use now is actually even better than the exchange cost, the hurdle cost. So my comments. Uh, so first, uh, you consider a no-run equilibrium. So if uh, uh, is you know the sunspot equilibrium and there's no sunspot, there's no bank run. Now I understand it is it's the standard model when banks commit to a deposit contract. And the possibility of a bank run is not anticipated. So it's really you know, the most simple version of the dynamic model. And the result is that it's really a very standard uh, optimal deposit contract that, that we would all recognize if, if we compare it to the, the original dynamic model. But that actually was quite surprising because you introduce this digital, uncertain digital need. Uh, these two new parameters, delta, the probability of being digital and cost uh, and, and tau, but they actually do not show up in the optimal deposit function, right? So that means to me that for some reason, there's no sharing of this risk ex ante. You don't know if digital or physical, but you know, where the liquidity needs are shared, the digital need is not shared. And that I think is very interesting. So my first suggestion would be to explain that because at least in the graph I had, uh, it was not. Because also later it means that CBC has no impact on the optimal policy. At least that's how I understand it. A uh, second common, uh, uh, still without CBC, is then about the run activity. So this model I understand now there's actually no commitment on the bank side. It can adjust the payoffs in case of withdrawal, uh, and there's a bank run. So all patient consumers withdraw. So my second suggestion then is to clarify kind of the type of deposit contract that you consider because I, I, I thought that it changed between sections from commitment to no commitment. And that means that you don't consider the case when there's a bank run and there's commitment. And I wonder if there's an impact of CBC there. It's a bit more standard at least in you. Um, and then clarify the bank run the next, but I think you did that in your presentation today. Uh, what is still a bit, I'm not exactly clear if I understand if there's a panic and everyone withdraws, how a punishment can stop me from withdrawing. So if I'm patient and I panic, the bank can adjust the contract, lower my payments or increase my payment, and that somehow stops the bank run. And that I, would, I, I didn't really understand in the, in the paper yet, why that would stop me from panicking. Yeah, and again, there's no, uh, in the optimal deposit contract, these parameters don't show up again, which uh, for the same reason was surprising to me. Finally, on, the, uh, on CBC then, so CBC here will allow for faster withdrawals and uh, digital purchases. So the first result that, that, that you had is that this could increase welfare because you have these inpatient and digital agents uh, that used to withdraw into cash, because they're impatient and then go and buy their Pepsi uh, and then go to the, the Amazon because so it was a cost. But now they can withdraw on CBDC and, and use the CBDC on Amazon. And that, that saves this exchange from that's about for benefit. Uh, implicitly, though, there's an assumption that they cannot use deposits on Amazon. Uh, I think that has to be motivated. 
which I think you can do. Um, and then on the second result on the over-reliance on CDC, and this is where I, what I meant with more equations, uh, because I was wondering what exact type is driving these results. So you have these four types, and in case of a bank run, in case of CBC, uh, uh, there's this increase in withdrawals to CBC. So to me, that seems that must be the patient in the digital type. So if your patient and there's no CBC, and, the, and if your patient is digital without CBC, you stay in the bank. But if your patient and digital with CBC will withdraw, and that's why there's now more withdrawals of CBC. And I think what would help is you clarify kind of for each type the incentive compatibility constraint to see if, you know, which type is actually affected by the introduction of CBC, uh, and especially the, you know, the patient depositor's choice of withdrawal. So think about it time. So I have a few, uh, yeah, you have a really email. Thanks, uh, <laughs> no, that's a very nice paper. I'm very curious to see uh, uh, where it's going to go. Well, thank you so much for the conference organizers for choosing our paper for this event. Uh, my name is Sharon Ronks, and I'll be presenting my paper called Leverage and Save the Point Peg. This paper is going to work with Gary Horn, that please Chase Ross, and Alex Bernalock. So this paper is going to be about stable coins, which are digital assets that promise to maintain a price of one dollar and to be redeemable on at par on the internet. So there are many different types of stable coins. Some are collateralized by traditional, often traditional assets, like uh, many of the largest ones, like Tether, USDC, Dai. These collateral uh, that's underlying these are ten can be uh, illiquid. And it is often in traditional financial assets. Think of this as treasury bills and commercial paper. They're also uncollateralized or uh, algorithmic stable funds. And in this paper, we're going to focus primarily on those that are collateralized. So stable points are exposed to fund risk because those reserves are invested in traditional financial assets like treasury bills and commercial paper. So to the extent that there might be concerns in money markets, for example, then the stable point issuer is exposed to run risk. However, the stable point issuer doesn't pay any interest. So this, the question we're asking in this paper is how can stable points maintain the despite the fact that there's run risk and the issuer doesn't pay anything to compensate for that? The answer is going to be through secondary markets. So a uh, main use of stable points are going to be ability getting leverage in other more volatile digital assets. And those and the way that you can do that is by borrowing stable points to use collateral. So in in that sense, the, those lending rates are going to be on the secondary market and they're going to compensate for runners. So that's how stable points are going to be able to maintain their pet despite the fact that they have the, there's no primary market. Uh, compensation for the funds. So this paper is going to show that runnable debt can maintain a peg as long as it's useful for speculation. So as long as there is demand to get levered exposure in assets like Bitcoin, stable coins are going to be able to maintain their peg. So demand from stable coin comes from their use for, as margin for leverage trading positions in other digital assets. So stable points are very important in that you can, similar to financing a stock purchase, let's say you have $100, well, you can get a margin loan and get $1,000, and now you can buy, uh, let's say, $1,000 of Apple stock. Similarly, you can use stable points as collateral, you can get a margin loan, and use the borrowed stable points to get exposure into Bitcoin. So, this is very important that there's demand for the speculative assets. So say that lever, there's no demand for the speculative assets. Well, now the traders who are taking on leverage using the stable coins no longer demand those stable coins. So there is no one who's going to be willing to pay very high lending rates to borrow the stable coin. And as a result, if it falls below a certain level that compensates for the issuance from this, there's going to be a run on the stable coin issue. 
So this has stable points are a very important link between traditional financial assets and the digital uh, digital digital asset economy. And this has very large financial stability implications. So the reserves of the stable coins are often held in the traditional financial asset. And stable coins are this important link. So say that there's a shock in crypto markets. One of the important mechanisms that we look at in this paper to show how stable coins keep their peg is by adjusting their underlying reserves. And by when they adjust their underlying reserves, so say there's a crypto shock. And now stable coin needs to meet a lot of redemptions. To do so, they're going to have to sell off those reserves that they hold. And that can lead to disruptions in money markets, for example. And the opposite is also true. A shock to money markets can have problems for digital assets. So there's some evidence of this. For example, Heather's commercial paper disclosure, the global science, the paper, uh, an article in the FT from, from last year. A couple of years ago, Tether, I believe, at one point was perhaps the third largest single holder of US commercial paper. So, if there is a large change in commercial paper holdings, a sell off could be quite disruptive for commercial paper markets. Secondly, there's a paper by Sang Kim who was on the market last year, um, and he shows that a one standard deviation increase in the daily issuance of major stable coins. Results in a 10.7% increase in the commercial paper issuance quality. So this shows how you know changes in the issuance of major stable coin can directly affect commercial paper issuance quantity. So uh, I'm going to briefly talk about the model of CAP. So there are three agents that are the stable coin issuer, stable coin investor, and cryptocurrency traders. So in the standard uh, minting and burning of stablecoin tokens, the stablecoin investors give dollars to the stablecoin issuer. And the stablecoin issuer issues a stablecoin. Importantly, the issuer here isn't paying any interest to the stablecoin investor. The stablecoin issuer is investing the funds that is raised in traditional reserves, which are a combination of liquid and liquid assets. Uh, the issuer earns the return from the investments, um, but the, again, it doesn't pay any interest to the stablecoin holders. Instead, the way that the stablecoin investors or holders are able to uh, be compensated for their for their money that they put get into the stablecoin issuer is going to be on the secondary market. So, the through a margin loan, the stablecoin investor, uh, the, the, sorry, the Cryptocurrency trader is going to borrow the stable coin, and at the end of the loan, has to pay back the stable coin and some interest. So the cryptocurrency trader then takes the stable coin and has its own funds to invest in these uh, in speculative cryptocurrencies. So you can see here that there's this linkage between traditional reserves, so the traditional financial market, and speculative cryptocurrency, so the digital assets. So the stable points are this very important linkage that you, in which shocks from one market can be transmitted to the other. This, this model is a three-period model. In period zero, investors are putting money into the stable point and getting token. And the issuer is investing in these, these uh, liquid and illiquid reserves. So in period T for one, investors get a private signal about the liquidity of the reserves and the liquidation value, and they make a decision whether or not to redeem. If there are enough investors that choose to redeem, then there's going to be a run on the stable coin. And in period T equals two, if there's no run, the investors are going to lend their tokens to traders who use it to take a levered position in crypto. So in this period, it's lending rate will go This paper. Uh, in the model, there's a few important components. The first is the stable coin lending rate. So the stable coin lending rate, again, is the secondary market rate that people, holders of stable coins can lend them out to other people. Um, the lending rate is uh, has to be such that it makes traders break even between a levered payoff and an outside option. And importantly, the stable coin lending rate is going to be increasing in speculative demand. 
And I'll show you some empirical results that show that there is this very clear relationship that if there's more demand for speculation, uh, which we measure in a couple of ways, the stable coin lending rate is going to be higher. And that compensates again for the run risk of the stable coin. This paper uses global game techniques to pin down the unique probability of the run. So the stable coin issuer is exposed to run risk because the stable coin reserves are invested in the liquid assets. So in the, the, the in, in in certain cases, the liquidity liquidation value is going to be too low, and uh, there could be a potential too, potentially too many uh, redemption uh, of the stable coin. So the main result uh, is that the run risk of the stable coin for sure is going to be decreasing in the lending rate R and also decreasing in the share of liquid reserves L. So for example, if you think of stable coin as vested in primarily T bills and a little bit of commercial paper. Well, if it needs to meet the redemptions of a lot of uh, holders, it, it should, might be able to more easily than if their commercial paper holdings are going to be percent So the run risk is uh, going to be decreasing in how, how, how liquid the reserves are. So the main proposition in this paper, we show that uh, how is stable coin going to maintain when it moves on to shock? So, uh, for example, if there's less demand for the speculative cryptocurrency, that's going to make the price of the stable coin decrease below one. So, how is the stable coin issuer going to adjust in order to maintain its path? Well, there's two channels through which it can change. The first is the liquid asset portfolio share channel. So, substituting from more illiquid reserves toward more liquid reserves. That of course can be due in a short amount of time. The, the other option is through the redemption channel. So by changing, if you keep the composition that you have of treasury bills and commercial paper, and instead what you can do is allow for the fact that there's now lower demand for speculation, which means lower demand for stable points to facilitate that trade, and allow for the fact that now that there's lower demand, and as a result, allow more redemptions to occur. So that would decrease your total number of certain of these things. So there are these two different ways that the issuer can adjust to maintain its head. Uh, now I'll move on and show you some of the empirical results that give more evidence of some of the things that I discussed in the model. So in the paper, we have uh, some tables that show suggest that stable points are good for black. Uh, for example, they have lower haircuts than most other digital assets, and that is part of the reason why there's a uh, demand for them in terms of taking on leverage. Second of all, we're going to show uh, with some identification that speculative demand drives stable coin lending rates. So, uh, demand for, uh, you know, you want to invest in safe, but in, sorry, in Bitcoin, that's what's going to drive the stable coin lending rates to compensate for the run risk. And then we'll show, I'll show you some evidence of those two channels that uh, issuers can use to maintain the head. So here are some summary statistics about some of the stable coins and in terms of their price in general. And it's they're reasonably successful at maintaining their head. Um, and on the bottom are the margin lending rates. So those secondary lending, secondary market lending rates. You can see they're they're quite high, maybe seven to eight percent. So these lending rates are going to be the ones that are compensating for runners. Even though the issuer doesn't pay, the secondary market will allow holders of stable coins to be compensated for run risk, and therefore stable coin issuer can be paid. The way we're going to measure clever trading demand, demand to use leverage to get exposure to Bitcoin, are using perpetual interest. So uh, you can think that these are in specific pairs, so like the Bitcoin Tether perpetual future, and they're, um, they're liquid derivatives that allow uh, holders to get a lot of leverage exposure up to 100, 100 times. This is one of the largest uh, perpetual future markets, and uh, they are settled in single. So you can think of a perpetual future as very similar to a standard future. 
except now there's no expiration date at which you would expect the spot and future price to converge. Instead, the way that the spot and future prices are kept close together are through funding. So if the future is trading at a premium to the spot, uh, investors that are long the future pay a positive funding rate to those that are short. So this is what the, the perpetual future funding rate looks like. You can see that it, it varies quite a bit with time. Uh, this is for two specific pairs. So we're going to use this at a measure of leverage trading and show some of those dynamics of how it's related to the positively related to the interest rate. That um, so I plotted on the x axis here that perpetual future funding rate. Our, me our measure of speculative demand. And on the y axis is margin lending, the stable point lending. So this sh scatter shows very clearly this positive relationship between speculative demand and the stable point lending. Of course, this is uh, like a correlation, right? The, what we want to do is try to get some identification to show that speculative demand and stable point lending have a negative relationship. So you might think that there's something else that could drive both, perhaps in digital assets. So what we're going to use is an uh, instrumental variables approach to try to get to some identification. The instrument we're going to use is major league baseball viewership. So something that's not within digital assets, which you might think might drive both demand for Bitcoin and uh, let's see. So, uh, the MLB, the Major League Baseball, and FTX had a sponsorship. Um, and that put the logo, the FTX logo, you can see on the record, um, umpire uniforms. So the umpires wore this patch on their uniform for uh, all regular season, postseason, and spring training games. So we're, what we're going to use is the data on television viewership on nationally televised MLB games. Uh, this is in 2021 and 2022, and uh, I suppose somewhat conveniently, the timing works out that the World Series ends and the FTX collapses. <laughs> so we think that our instrument is, is valid during this time period. Um, so we're, we use specifically the daily average of the household rating, which measures the percentage of households watching the game. The idea behind this, of course, is that advertising is effective. And we think this might satisfy the exclusion restriction in the sense that the baseball season is set well in advance and it seems improbable that crypto events uh, would affect the, the viewership. So, this is the second stage regression where we're using, in the first stage, the household rating, the viewership, to estimate the future's funding rate. And then in the second stage table, we're regressing the stable fund lending rate on the futures funding. So again, the futures funding rate is our measure of speculative demand. So the, what these coefficients translate to is, uh, so the futures funding rate, our measure of speculative demand, a one standard deviation moving the that would be uh, 33 uh, base point. Uh, sorry, percent points, and that would translate to the futures funding rate increasing about four percent. So, and that is about like 50 percent increase. So, a one standard deviation increase in speculative demand translates to the stable point lending rate increasing by 50 percent, which we think is a uh, reasonable. So, last, I'd like to discuss a little bit about these channels about price stability. How is the stable point issuer able to meet these head? It has those two options. The first is by changing what their reserves are. That could be very difficult to do, especially in a short amount of time. The second is by changing, allowing for the fact that there's less demand to manifest in a lower supply circulating state. So here, what we've done is, as I mentioned, it could be very difficult to change those underlying reserves especially quickly. And it's difficult also to find data. So we have here Heather's quarterly disclosures. There are going to be uh, seven data points here. And we plotted the liquid share of the portfolio uh, on the x-axis. And on the y-axis, we plotted the perpetual futures funding rate. 
her measure of speculative demand. And there's a negative relationship, which suggests that when speculative demand increases, the liquid asset share is increasing. Of course, this is uh, seven data points, but it does suggest that there is this relationship between these two variables, that, that this is a way in which issuers are able to maintain their pay. And we have more details in the paper about whether or not, you know, how, what are the outcomes if the liquid, if the share of safe assets, the share of liquid assets can be adjusted quickly or not. And, and, and if they can seamlessly, though, uh, it, it's very simple for the issuer to be. So the other option is through redemptions, so changing the supply of circulating stable funds. Well, this is, uh, as I mentioned, liquid asset share. It's not continuous to monitor. Then what we're going to do is look at redemptions, which is uh, observed on a very regular basis. About one third of the days have a redemption, and uh, we're going to measure them as the inverse of uh, issues or the negative issues. So uh, I know I'm quite going to be running quite short on time, so I'll interpret this uh, this result here, which is that when the future's funding rate decreases, what that means is speculative demand is decreasing. And what you see in terms of issues is that is going to also decrease, which means that redemptions are going, up, yeah, going to increase. So there's this negative relationship between speculative demand and redemptions. So this is an important channel through which issuers are able to uh, adjust to maintain its pay. So with that, I'm going to conclude. Um, privately produced money can maintain its dollar pay, even if it's not, no questions asked in the words of Holmes Trump. But agents have to be compensated for the risk. So if a stable point issuer isn't going to compensate for that risk, then it's going to require the secondary markets to compensate for that risk. Stable points are issued are used for speculation, and these the lending rates in the secondary market are what are compensating for run risk. And there in this paper, we reconcile and point a few two important facts, which is that first, stable points are not fully useful as money despite their success at maintaining their pay. And second, interest rates on the secondary market are, are quite high. And very importantly, the link in this model. Crypto speculation to the real economy. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. So, um, Jordan clearly laid out what they're trying to do, and they actually deliver it. So, at the stable point, we did not surprise, even though they uh, pay as much of risk, but pay no interest. So, they act like the, a bank, but they don't pay interest. So, it's kind of weird. How they are going to be able to do it? Well, maybe we are going to link different markets. Uh, the, the uh, as a way to potentially compensate for this round risk. So how do they construct it? A very nice framework, they look into theory, that is a fantastic uh, model to look at. And they combine the model that, that we saw previously in the background, uh, dynamic, and then actually link to other markets, and that's how the competition can, can occur. And that's through these um, collateralized lending to common markets. Then what do they do? The theory provides all these fantastic uh, predictions, then they go and test. So that's what I'm saying. It's you cannot get better than me. So uh, one of the things that I learned, and maybe you already know them, but let me use them since I have some time to think about it. So stable coins are equitable to deposits, so they're subject to runs, right? They don't pay interest. Uh, so how they're going to be able to compensate this risk? As uh, uh, where we saw, well, the can actually come and save risk uh, um, by actually allowing them to be used as collateral in other markets. And then through that uh, additional value that these stable coins can provide, then some additional value can be actually paid and be compensated for these values. So um, what are the stable coin users going to do? Well, they're going to inverse these reserves. Uh, for profits, and then they're going to adjust these sort of reserves to actually make sure that they're actually trading at one because that's what they promised to do. That's what they say. So, uh, since they're going to be able to compensate uh, um, its um, holders by actually looking at this additional demand, uh, we need to look closely at this other market as uh, this uh, um, speculative market and the potential demand for disabled ones uh, as collateral. 
And when uh, they keep trading at par, uh, they do that by moving the portfolio or allowing it. Right? So that's how, even though it's not a bank, I'm able to compensate as it were a bank. Uh, and should set, um, subject to that. So what are the model key features? Um, and again, I, I strongly suggest to go and look to it. Uh, the main uh, model features that I, I as I read them is that uh, patient investors do not want to hold the cryptocurrency directly, right? Uh, lending the stable coin uh, takes place only after patients, uh, investors have decided whether to redeem or not redeem the stable coin. Like in the previous model that we saw, you get this signal, it's private, and then you need to decide what to do. Traders have access to an upside option. Uh, that you always have access to, and it pays a gross rate of return. On. And in all these models, we are built on diamond and thing, but you have all this potential equity, right? So, how are we going to refine them? They actually do it very nicely by introducing this uh, global game approach. Um, uh, that is going to then give very precise definitions on when potentially the runs happen. You have this probabilistic measure, and this is this way. So each individual token holder receives this private uh, signal um, to redeem or not to redeem. And based on this posterior about the payoff of um, their beliefs about the actions of others, right? So I received this signal. I know everyone is going to receive the signal. Depending on that, then I decide to actually uh, redeem the uh, So what is this uh, model going to tell you? It gives you a whole bunch of money predictions. And then what they do is they think all these different predictions in the data and the next one uh, So what are these things that they actually do go and spend effort in trying to uh, corroborate? So stable fund lending rates are tightly linked to special demand for cryptocurrencies. Prediction in the model, take in the data. When the expected return for expected losses increases, the stable fund lending growth, <coughs> growth rate take in the data. Stable coin issuers can offset negative shocks for cryptocurrency by increasing their portfolio share of these assets all the else in the line. And the other one is the lending rates increase after the token uh, supply falls, right? So all this comes very nicely from the theoretical model and they go and able to check that in the data. So I have to spend quite some time, hard thinking is um, how the hell I'm gonna give them something that they haven't bought or that is meaningful uh, value added. And hopefully there is some value value. So as, she pointed out, you have this potential problem in the genetic, right? And then that is going to be difficult. And, and they thought very carefully of how to address this, and they did this instrumental variable approach. And then I thought quite hard is there's something else that I could do in value added. Luckily for me, I do like watching Netflix series, in particular the Formula One. And I realized that indeed there may be something that we could be using that, using exactly the same idea that you had with your previous uh, identification strategy. And why I thought maybe Formula One is sort of a good idea. Well, it's a larger uh, scope in the people that we actually look at this stuff. Um, 23rd races, 1.5 billion uh, viewers. There's quite a bit uh, more there. That, uh, and the nice features that you identified in terms of scandals or reset, and it doesn't kind of actually works, it kind of, it kind of does, right? Uh, so, so I thought that maybe that would be an additional way, right? Because maybe, uh, as far as I understand, you know, baseball is a very exciting game. It's maybe the market <laughs> for it is maybe US driven, but indeed, this is a kind of a world, right? Uh, market, I mean, 724, so we will be able to go upgrade them on the video. So, that's one thing. Uh, uh, the other thing that I'm also going to suggest that it was kind of hard in terms of the theoretical model, I was thinking, um, what are the alternative potential uses for uh, stable coins? And then the first thing that you think about is, well, in inflationary environments, what is that you do? You want to protect for it, right? Before, what we used to do, we hold US dollar. Right? So I have right here, that's the story that people were told us. You want to protect from inflation, you hold US dollar. Well, now you have a potential alternative, and that's to hold stable coins. And I was kind of kind of flying back when I look, and there's indeed quite a few experiences that people are actually using this to actually hedge among the local inflation, right? Um, and the other thing that I was very surprised is that this is among small potatoes, uh, especially for Latin America, right? Which is a third of transactions are actually both uh, for retail payments, right? So that to me strikes from the theoretical of one of all, uh, an additional that you could do is maybe introduce an additional set of regions where you actually have a 
prefer habitat, you actually get some value by holding this thing rather than having the option value of potentially being used in this other market where I can give you lots of value. And why I'm saying this, because you also, and she can show you, you also in your paper produce these probabilities of actually having a run, and you can actually do very nicely because you have so much information that you could quantify this risk. Well, you have this set of agents where the that value stable could be because itself because it produces another service and that's uh, the inflation hedge. That may be quite, quite important in, in the quantitative aspect, not necessarily in the inside that your theoretical model or is. The other one that I thought, but this is just uh, daydreaming and it's way beyond your paper. Um, well, in the diamond and dipping, and in this room, there's people that have worked quite a bit on it. Uh, we do have contracts that um, allow for being dynamically adjusted. And we did see some here, but there's a, a large literature where maybe you want to do that. So I thought, well, and the first thing that came to mind, uh, I had to scratch my head a little bit. By the way, Todd Kister's uh, notes on buying them and is very good. Um, Green and Lean. Green and Lean, what did they have? They had this uh, mechanism design approach. They said, can we design some way of compensation of these deposits in such a way that we prevent wrong? Runs, right? So I'm thinking, well, can we then think the same sort of idea within the stablecoin uh, world? And rather than having sort of a stable coin, maybe what we would have is a stable crawling peg or something like that, that maybe there are different ways that it could potentially depend uh, on the option that I have using the secondary market. And why are you saying this is kind of important? Well, because now we can actually put these things in, in contracts, right? We can actually say under which conditions are redeem and then before these things, these contracts that these mechanism design things were put in out, it was kind of spooky. But now it actually seems like it's actually potentially implemented. Bottom line, read this paper. I didn't get paid for it. So if you have a long claim right like I do, uh, definitely read it. Um, uh, a very nice way to introduce global games in a, in a very practical way. Thank you.